there's always another way. I, I just find adversity, I'm there to learn something. And I have failed at a number of things. And if you don't get the learning, then it was a real wasted exercise to have gone through that much pain. From raising two daughters on her own to starting and running a very successful business, Jerry Hayes has never backed down from a challenge. Jerry Hayes, CEO of the furniture company Office Pavilion, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. How does one overcome adversity? The toughest situations can motivate some people to exceed what they thought to be their own limitations. As a young, unemployed, single parent of two daughters, Jerry Hayes faced adversity. With great tenacity, she overcame her tough situation and many other challenges that followed. She's the founder and CEO of Office Pavilion, one of the most successful woman-owned businesses in Hawaii. Life for Jerry Hayes began in a small New England town. Did you move around a lot growing up? No, I did not. I was born and raised in western Massachusetts in a very small town, Orange. Um, stayed in the same house till I left home at 17 and did not have any, uh, no, it was a Peyton Place. <laughs> It was a pain place? <laughs> you know, it, we, I remember when I saw that, when that came out, the book, I said, sounds like our town. You know, they're very small, very insular, Everybody knows very everything. provincial. Yeah. Did you have a sense of what you would be and do when you grew up? I only had one dream, and it was to get out of Orange. <laughs> Is that right? Why? It was so provincial. I used to joke, my mother even said, she said, you always said, I must have been switched in the crib. I don't belong here. <laughs> it was one of those places I just didn't feel like I belonged. And I had a twin brother and a younger sister, older sister, and, I, and everyone's still there. No one ever leaves this place. So you're not uh, in step with your twin brother as far as childhood? No, nope, we were. Um, it was just like I said, I just always felt like I had only one dream and it was to get out of Orange and go somewhere else. I graduated at just after I turned, actually right after I turned 17 and I got a job and moved to Worcester, which is a city south of us and knew I was out. <laughs> and was it better for you in another town? Oh yeah. In the same area? Yeah. It, it was just better to be in a city. I think I just needed to get out and get into a more, um, less provincial environment and with more exposure to more things and it was just it's a great thing to do to get out of orange what uh, where did life take you from this new city well actually here's the good news and bad news that's when i found out i was pregnant i was 17 and so i soon after you left right after orange. i left home and we had settled in with three girlfriends into an apartment in worcester massachusetts had the shock and surprise. They forgot that part about family planning. They didn't teach us. <laughs> and and who was the father? The, he'd been the guy I dated all through high school, and he had gone into the Navy. And of course, then it was a question of what do I do? And we ended up getting married, which was fine. But so I, so it didn't work out. Of course. I think children should never get children or have children. <laughs> but anyways. So anyway, so I was in Charleston, South Carolina. I went. We got married in Charleston, South Carolina. He was in the Navy. You know, it was the Vietnam War, and he got drafted. So he was in Charleston, South Carolina, and that's where my first daughter was born. And then I went to um, San Diego. My second daughter, Liam, was born in Balboa Naval. And then about two years later, I, it just wasn't working. You know, those marriages don't. So then I became a single parent. Anyways, but then I ended up, we got divorced, I moved back to Orange. To, to have a family? To try to figure uh, out what I was care. going to do. Yes, my mother helped, um, and that's when I decided that I had to figure out what I was really going to do with this life, and so that's when I went back to school and became a surgical tech. As a single parent with no support from her ex-husband, Jerry Hayes needed to learn to survive and provide. She began training and working as a surgical technician, prepping hospital operating rooms for surgeries. So liked your job? I did like my job. And 
found it fascinating and, and it gave me a real foundation obviously part of even getting that training is understanding all the medical terminology and what went on in hospitals and how it worked and, mm -hmm. Anyways, but then there was nowhere to go. It was one of those, you know, you worked long hours. I'd have to be in the hour by six and take call almost every other night. So I decided to move on, and that's when I met this woman. I was very active politically. I had joined, um, it was the 60s. <laughs> so here I was, got into very much a feminist, got into um, the anti-war movement, and... I was actually at a League of Women Voters meeting um, where they were talking about, you know, abortion reform and ended up meeting a, my mentor. She's one of the women who was, uh, and she, that's who I went to work for um, and became her executive assistant at this family planning program and then eventually became the director. Yeah. So that's a good job, right? Director of family planning? Yes. And actually what happened was um, I felt they were going at it wrong. which. That's usually how I do things. I say, well, you're doing this all wrong. Why would you put these clinics in a hospital? Young women. I can, I can understand why you're the boss of a business now. <laughs> I am a little bossy. <laughs> but I said, you're doing this wrong. You, you're trying to attract these populations who are terrified of going into hospitals. And so we opened, that's how I wrote an article, uh, co-authored an article on setting up non-hospital-based family planning clinics. Um, the first one's in New England, actually, and then it got put into Planned Parenthood International, and that's how I got invited to Hawaii. They wanted me to consult on, because they were having the same problem. People and, and did how, not... How controversial were uh, family planning clinics back then? Oh, very. And people were threatened. Were, I mean, there have been bombings and you right. know, violence associated right. with family planning. Family planning was, yeah. And so that was the other thing, putting it down on a main street in, you know, in a, in a rough neighborhood, even where so that women would have access without having, right? Because back then, even they would have to get their husband's, if they were married, they'd have to the husband's permission to go. So anyway, it was pretty radical to set up um, non-hospital-based family planning clinics. And That's what you did? Yeah. Hired my own doctors and nurses and set up this thing and did peer counseling and went out and spoke to Head Start groups and tried to, my belief was, obviously, having had the experience, I said, if you could stop first birth order with young women, you give them a chance to go on and really create their lives. Did you ever feel in peril, unsafe? Only once. <laughs> I got thrown down the stairs and my, someone came in late at night and they were, but mostly no, I was just too. So philosophically they, they decided they would. Yeah, and I, I, I'm also very feisty, so you can imagine I wasn't someone who was intimidated, so it was. Where did that come from, the feistiness oh. and going against the grain? I was, I was the black sheep in my family, and I was the girl. <laughs> Every time I, uh, my mother said, if you could have only learned to manage your mouth. But my father was so domineering, and I just wouldn't take it. And so I have to tell you, I got the belt more times than most people should ever get one. And you still mouthed off? And I would just say, fine, let's go, because I felt like I had to say my piece. And you, you took the, the I took blows. the beating. I said, you know what? but I will, you will not silence me. So you, you never had regrets about speaking out? Oh, no. As a result of Jerry Hayes' article about her non-hospital-based clinics, she was invited to Hawaii to meet with Planned Parenthood. Little did she know that her trip to Hawaii would alter the direction of her life. So here you were running a family planning clinic yeah. and, uh, and feeling that you were working for a good cause, yep. and then? And then I published that article and got invited to come to Hawaii, which I had never had any interest in, and came here and absolutely went ass over tea kettle. Thought it was the most fabulous place Why? What, what, what was it exactly? And, I mean, beside the surf and no, the No, no, it, it wasn't even the physical, it was the, remember I had two daughters and I was a single parent, and I remembered every time they would, and I had asked not to stay in hotels, I said, I like to stay with the directors or with a staff member, because I said, I want to experience the people of Hawaii. So I ended up having these wonderful experiences, and they had a, in Maui, I'll never forget, they were having a big um, pauhana. And then they brought all the children, and I said, and she said, you'd never not invite the keiki. And I looked at her, and I said, oh my God, in Boston, you don't understand. They'll call me and say, Jerry, can you, if you can find a babysitter, we'd love you to come to the party. And I would always go, 
it was just very, your worlds were really separate. And here I realized the appreciation of the fact that you had children was really high and that they, and the inclusiveness, you know, the people were just, so it was sort of like, hmm, this is a whole other way to look at. So I went back, that was June, um, 39 years ago. And I thought about it, and then Judy said she was going to quit her job over in Maui, and I, she said, why don't you take over Planned Parenthood Maui? So I gave my notice, sold everything I owned, and moved here in February uh -huh. first of 38 years ago. And? And got here. <laughs> and just as I was coming in December, she sent me a note and said, I can't afford to quit. We started building a house on the Hana Highway, and I said, you know what? I've sold everything, I've given my notice, I'm coming anyway, I'll figure it out. Did you really feel that, that seems so confident, did you feel confident? I did, I, I did. I just knew I was supposed to not be back there anymore. So I moved here and I didn't have a job but I had an apartment and I figured it out. <laughs> what did you figure out? You, 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 the I, door I was closed to you right. on Maui. I started applying for jobs and mostly social service, like I said, so I applied for the American Cancer Society job in Kauai, I interviewed for uh, all kinds of things and then I kept seeing how little they paid, which was kind of shocking. It still is shocking, right? The, the lack of value we, we place on social, social services. services. And I went, oh my goodness, I don't think I can do this. Well, then I saw these other ads, because you know, you're looking at all ads, and then there was this looking for a medical surgical salesperson to sell high level open heart equipment, packs and gowns. And so I was like, sounds like me. <laughs> Even though you had you sold I'd before? never sold a thing in my life. But it was one of those, I remembered saying, if you can use it, you could sell it. So I went in and interviewed, and he didn't hire me right away because he said, you know, he had this other nurse that he, he hired. And then he called me back, and he said, um, come in. And so I, I absolutely found my calling. Jerry Hayes relied on her background as a surgical technician to make the transition into medical sales, taking the time to learn the subtle ways of island culture and to sit and listen to her new customers was important to her success. I came from Boston, and as you can tell, New Englanders are, we're rough, we're aggressive. I obviously had a wicked accent then, now I only slip occasionally in park cars. <laughs> but back then I remember coming in and I went into every one of my operating room nurses and sat down and I just said, I need you to tell me what it would be that I could do for you that would make it important for you to buy from me and work with me. And they all said the same thing. Show up on time, keep your word, follow up, and tell the truth. And I was like, that's it? <laughs> but they must have liked that you asked them too, one on one. Oh yeah. Like, they mattered. They said, they said, no one's ever, and I said, they said, Jerry, number one, this is Hawaii. People think they're on time if they're three hours late. It's annoying because we're busy, we're running an OR. So I was like, oh. So I did, I just wrote it all down, I was like, and I remembered years later, all these, I, I still have this whole group, most of them are retired now, but all these directors of OR, they just said you were the best. And they said, the other thing is, because you'd used it, you knew how to do it. We could call you in, you could scrub in and help show everybody how to use the new equipment. And so it was, and then we'd sit in the nurse's lounge and just, you know, it was like it was a very easy, and then I learned all the rest, so I had to sell operating room, but then I also had to sell other kinds of medical supplies. Working full-time as a single mother with no family support was a struggle for Jerry Hayes. She credits her Hawaii friends and neighbors for helping to raise her two daughters. It must be very hard to raise children without a grandma. You know, people have family and really use them here to, to help them with their kids. Yeah, that was the hardest. How did you manage? That was the hardest. I had... Oh, I had a... <laughs> I don't know how I did it don't know how I did it. Someone said, how did you do it? I said, you just do what you do. I had great neighbors, I will say. I lived on a sweet little street, McEwell Drive, and all the neighbors, and they all watched out for me. They just thought I was, right? I mean, it was really sweet. I was like, hey, mama, we watch the kids when you, you know, till you get home. So I was very lucky. That, again, that, that culture that knew and respected how hard I worked. And so I had Walter and Harry across the street, and I mean, those kids couldn't have done a thing without me, them getting busted by them. 
A few years into her new sales career, Jerry Hayes received an opportunity that would propel her from salesperson to running a sales operation. Okay, so I, I did med surge sales. Then I got a call from this man who owned a business and had a division here in Hawaii, medical business interiors in Seattle. And he said, I heard you're the best salesperson in Hawaii. And I said, well, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Tells ever be a little chutzpah. <laughs> and he said, um, I'm looking for someone to run my territory over there. And it's business interiors. Business Medical interiors. Business interiors. This is okay. hilarious. So he flies over on a Sunday, and I met him at the top of the Ilikai after three Mai Tais. He, I should have asked for more. I left too much money on the table. <laughs> but it was like he, he hired me. And so I took over, um, and it was doing basically doing interiors for hospitals. You mean providing furniture for providing hospitals? Providing furniture, but also the having to do, you know, go out and meet with architects and designers and end users. And the part I could do is because I understood material distribution says I could do some of this, but the rest of it was, and I learned it. Again, one of those, I don't know where you get that piece that just says, you know what, I can figure this out, and I did. Was it hard to figure out or was, I mean, does it come easily? It came pretty quick, but I had, again, I have always been lucky. You had somebody, an installer, and he said, I just said, Gary, what am I going to do? I said, this architect's calling me. He wants to show me these plans. He said, I'm going with your girlfriend, and I just, he said, just keep asking him questions, and when he asks you what you think, say, you know, I need to think about that and I'll get back to you. And he said, <laughs> so we get in there, guy rolls out the plans. I wouldn't have known, on, I didn't know electrical plumbing from, and I would just sit there and I'd tell him, well, so what's your concept? What are you trying to accomplish? And I got Carrie sitting in there and he's going, sir, I don't think that's gonna work because the way the doors are laid out. And so he was great because he actually knew how to do this. And he took me aside and he taught me how to read a blueprint and he taught me all the, and so I was very lucky. And we worked as a team. So this time you were not just selling, you were, you were running a business, right. a division of yes. a business. So I had to hire, and I did. I had an interior designer and I had a, a logistics person to handle shipping and do all those things. But I, I did what I did well and I was actually very good at knowing what I was good at and letting and delegating. So I let the interior designer take over and then I would let the gal who did the order entry. And So I think that's why it worked because I also didn't feel like I had to do it all. Mm -hmm. The, the ability to know that what you're good at and then let those who do what they're good at. Did you do the hiring? Uh, yes. Were you good at reading people? Well, I've got a... And you're I, still hiring, so I should ask you, are you good at reading people? Yeah, I'm actually pretty good at it. H here you are working, doing medical business interiors, and things went along quite well until they went very badly. What happened? I absolutely loved working for MBI and learned a whole, right? I learned the whole industry while I worked for Hank. And one of the biggest jobs, and it was so exciting to win it, was the HMSA was building a new state-of-the-art building um, over on Kamoku Street. And everybody kept saying, Jerry, there is no way they're gonna buy furniture. I said, there is no way they're not. How could they have you build a state-of-the-art building and then move that crap? I said, I have been in their offices. And he said, there's no way the board will approve it. I said, I'm going to figure a way. I said, because I know two things. They need an emotional coat hook to hang that decision on, and I'm going to find it. Because I said, it's how you sell the idea. Jerry Hayes came up with an innovative sales pitch, or an emotional coat hook, as she calls it, to refurnish all of her clients' new offices. But what should have been the sale of her career had an unforeseen outcome. The point would be, why would you have a beautiful new facility and move all your people into it and then move all this old furniture when you could? I said, I, and I would handle the whole disposal, the sale of it and everything and give you a credit toward the purchase of new furniture. I said, I think it's at least worth, I'll write you a proposal to give the board. Fine. And he took it and they, of course they jumped on it with both feet. And it was amazing. And it was, it was a great it was sell for you. It was the emotional hook and, and it, it ended up being like a $6 million sale, which 
20, 30 years ago. That's a lot of money. That would be like a 30 million. Eight floors, everything, front door to back, everything. So the good news and bad news was after the job was done, that's when I found out that my boss had put all of these expenses against the job and there was $87,000 in commission that he wasn't going to pay me. And my girlfriend, because she worked in accounting, said I had to sit in these meetings with these three men going, no woman should ever make that much money. Did you get the money? No, the attorneys all get money. Don't you know that? Mm. So I ended up with about 37000 which is still okay. And it was enough for me to just say I can go do my own thing now. Jerry Hayes says that experience of being shut out of an $87,000 sales commission left her unwilling to work for somebody else. She decided to start her own business. You know, when I heard, um, I, I went to a Pacific Business News event and I heard that the top woman-owned business in Hawaii was called Office Pavilion. And I, I thought, Let's see, what, what would make the most money? What would be, you know, what is that? You know, what would Office Pavilion do? <laughs> it's, it's just incredible to me that it's, you know, you're a, a contract furniture provider. And, and that's what people don't understand. Every time you go to the airport and you sit in that black and silver seating, that is Eames Tandem Sling seating that we have done since 1976 out at that airport. If you go into a hospital, if you go into rehab, all that renovation at rehab we just did, it's all done in this fabulous new compass program that we do. So I do hospitals, I do healthcare, we did Case Middle School, we've Iolani, we, um, UHIT that just opened, the Cancer Research Center. So uh, I just think of all the different pieces to this business. It isn't just furniture. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, I've done all of special operations. I got really, I have a lot of fun with special ops guys. And you have to know how people work in order to serve them in this business. Yes. You have to know a lot about them and their business. Yeah, and how it's changing for them. Part of the biggest challenge right now is really helping them get in front of the curve of everything that's changing. Healthcare is just, everybody's on their ear on this one, right? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there's just so many things that part of it is that's why you educate yourself and you try to become a partner and a proactive person solution provider because they're all facing, all right, it's becoming very competitive. In 2011, and again in 2012, Office Pavilion was named the number one woman-owned business in Hawaii by Pacific Business News. One of those years, company revenues reached $37 million. Over time, Jerry Hayes' business has expanded beyond Hawaii to the Philippines, Japan, Korea, and Guam. As the driving force behind the company that she founded, Jerry admits it's been difficult for her to loosen the reins for the next generation of the family company. You could be retiring if you wanted to. <laughs> could be retiring yesterday. I have started my exit strategy. I have two daughters, Wendy and Leanne, and my son-in-law, Bruce, in the business, and they've been there a long time. It, it's, but it's so different, you know, I think that is the next thing. How, how do they learn, how do you teach and mentor people into that entrepreneurial piece as opposed to the maintenance piece of keeping a business just running? Mm -hmm. And that is probably the challenge I've got right now is um, they're getting there. Um, I'm having to shut up and back off. I think that is the hardest because sometimes we're doing strategic business and I could type that up and have it out tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, but then it wouldn't be their plan and it isn't allowing them to, uh, it's not forcing them to think the issues through. Is it important for you that your business live on after you? Yeah. That's probably the biggest struggle I'm having right now. Um, I want, I really want my kids to see it as a legacy business that create, creates all kinds of, it creates jobs. Uh, we had a staff meeting Friday and the first one of the year. And you look at, you have 42 people. Now multiply that time all the people they support. And you realize the power of, of when you create jobs and you create a business. It's not about you. And I want them to know that my grandsons, I mean, I honestly look at my, grand, my youngest and I said, Lucy, you're in the chair. 
He's the, he's the salesman in the group. And I, I said, what a wonderful thing it would be to have a third generation come and sit in that chair. And, and, and I said, your job is to take it from 30 million to 150 million and maybe open up Australia. I said, you know, um, I've done what I set out to do and I'd love to see you grow it and I'd love to see Bruce Isco said, I'm going to Harvard, Grandma, and then I'm coming back and take the chair. And I said, <laughs> but just to know, I, I said, I said, do you know what a gift a business like this is? I said, it creates a life for you. You create livelihoods for others. You get to do good in the world. You get to have all the fun and travel. I mean, I have, I have traveled the world. My true love is, I, besides reading, is traveling. So, yeah, I want to see it live on. Jerry Hayes says that she has women business mentors and she believes Hawaii is a supportive and encouraging environment for entrepreneurial women. She is certainly a testament to that. Mahalo to Jerry Hayes for sharing her story with us and mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho! For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. Okay, I've had three people. Like, I do not believe you haven't written a book. And I'm like, what would I write? And I said, well, if I ever wrote a book, it would be called And It Ain't About Furniture because it's about your life and how all these things and all the serendipity and all the hilarious stories. Leanne said, don't, you can't tell these stories, mom, when you're with <laughs> Leslie. <laughs>